Hello. Hello. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Live from Oslo. So Oslo is a set of libraries that uh, were initially part of the Oslo Incubator repository. They got pulled out of, uh, you know, over a long period of time from different projects, and we've tried to maintain the Oslo libraries uh, with a consistent, stable interface for different projects to use. So if you pick any project that you have, uh, Neutron, Nova, uh, Cinder, uh, they use Oslo libraries. And there are various Oslo libraries uh, that have evolved over a long period of time. Um, and we are also creating new libraries, uh, starting from scratch and trying to define the interfaces and uh, you know for people to use. So this is to, just to give you an idea of what we've been up to in the last cycle. Um, we have one new library called Oslo Um This is a replacement for Oslo Root Wrap. Uh, if you know, uh, some of the operators uh, are very familiar with uh, how to protect. Uh, Using Oslo root wrap, uh, now we have we have a new one uh, rolling out called Oslo Prevsep that we are trying to get our, our different projects to adopt. Um, then we have some new drivers for Oslo messaging. Uh, we'll go more into details uh, about uh, the individual uh, drivers that we are working on. And there's a bunch of new features uh, that we are rolling out. Um, this is not. An exhaustive list. This is just, you know, the top of the head um, that that we came up with. Uh, but there's a whole bunch happening, uh, and we have updated documentation as well for all these features. So if you are a developer uh, working on any of the uh, OpenStack projects, or if you are bringing a new project into uh, OpenStack, then you should definitely check out what we have in terms of Oslo libraries and try to use uh, the Oslo libraries. So uh, to g help get us started, uh, I have a panel of uh, team members here. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, you would have to talk to Josh. <laughs> Hi. So Josh is the PTL for the upcoming release, and uh, I, I'm the PTL for the previous release. So I'm handing off uh, stuff to Josh as well. So, um, so to get us started, we have uh, Dima Oklov. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about uh, the 0MQ and the PCAR drivers. And then uh, we'll hand off to the Oslo Prevsep and uh, documentation. Uh, OK. Dima? Thank you. Uh, first of all, probably. Uh, when we started development of uh, Pika driver, um, uh, I heard uh, a lot of questions like, um, why do you do this? We have combo driver, and why do we need another driver? Uh, I will answer for these questions now. Um, we have uh, a couple of problems connected with, uh, um, we don't know, with with which one, uh, but um, somehow uh, rabbit clusters uh, can be divided for few pieces, uh, for, for some pieces, um, uh, and we uh, don't know uh, what is going on because a lot of uh, uh, we have a lot of abstractions, a lot of uh, dependency libraries like uh, Oslo Core, uh, Oslo Combo Driver, uh, Combo itself, Combo extension for RabbitMQ, RabbitMQ itself. And uh, when we um, had um, troubles with uh, debugging these issues, we asked uh, Pivotal, uh, guys from Pivotals to help us. And they said uh, they uh, uh, recommended us uh, to update uh, libraries and company stack uh, because it's uh, probably uh, some issues are already fixed and even not if not uh, it's much easier to fix in code which is close to upstream. And now we have new implementation uh, based on. Pika library. Uh, it's a uh, lightweight um, 
core Python uh, library, which is uh, developed uh, as a RabbitMQ client and don't have any, not needed uh, for other IMQP brokers uh, abstractions. <coughs> So uh, we it's uh, now, now we, we can implement um, more efficiently um, driver because we have full support of uh, modern RabbitMQ features um, and uh, avoid uh, redundant functionality not needed for RabbitMQ. Uh, also, uh, Combo drivers has uh, a lot of uh, legacy code and um, problem connected uh, with it. Um, we uh, don't know uh, why some code is needed and um, it's uh, much uh, complicated to implement some new features or do refactoring because we don't know can we uh, remove this code or we should leave it. This driver is developed from scratch and um, it's much more easier uh, implement new features and uh, fix bugs and something like that. Uh, so now we have two options, combo driver and pick a driver. And uh, why uh, you should uh, or probably not should switch to pick a driver? The few, a few uh, benefits of new driver. Uh, it fixes uh, a lot of uh, problem by design, by, by design uh, as I said before. Uh, for example, heart beats, uh, which uh, are already uh, implemented by Pika library. Reconnections problem, uh, which uh, previously um, was used from uh, combo library, and now we have uh, our own implementation in Pika driver, in Pika driver, which we can uh, customize for our needs. Uh, it's also mm, much more configurable than Combo. It's not because it's better, but um, uh, it just have uh, already uh, a lot of possibility for configuration. Uh, also, I managed to uh, make it uh, mature enough. Uh, it passes uh, all Tempest scenarios. Um, and also, it's uh, uh, much more efficient, about 50% uh, 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 on RPC calls, but probably it's not very significant because it's very uh, small middleware and uh, uh, I guess that uh, target application will uh, eat uh, much more resources. Uh, so why should we uh, not to use Pika driver? It's not compatible to combo driver. Um, it uses uh, different uh, naming of uh, queues, uh, different exchanges, and different configurations. So uh, rolling updates uh, is not available from combo driver to pick and driver. And if you want to make update, you need downtime, at least for now. Uh, it could utilize RabbitMQ a bit more if uh, we made uh, performance tests when we had um, three nodes uh, RabbitMQ cluster and a lot of clients and servers. And when uh, RabbitMQ uh, was a bottleneck, uh, Pika driver uh, works uh, slower than Comp about 10% uh, because uh, he uh, provides um, more strict uh, delivery guarantee and it, and, uh, it eats more RabbitMQ resources. Also, this driver is new, not widely used, so probably less mature, and uh, uh, you can be uh, faced with some new issues when combo driver works better. Uh, so how do you, you use Pika driver? <coughs> 
it's very easy. Uh, you should do the same as with uh, combo driver. Just change uh, transport URL and uh, add pickup prefix as uh, protocol. And this slide also you can find uh, links to configuration guide. And if you are interested, please take a look. And uh, my plans for Newton. Uh, so uh, currently we have patching process uh, for making configurable uh, serialization. Uh, we expect that it uh, that that message pack will be a, a little bit faster than JSON serialization. Uh, implement configurable connection factory because now. Um, uh, combo driver eats a lot of connections, uh, one per uh, listener, and um, also have uh, has connection pool for message sending. Uh, with the Pika library, um, I have already patch on review, which allows to use single connection per process. Um, uh, also, challenge, it's implementing generic, generic solution for cross-driver rolling update to allow possibility switch from Pika to, from Combo to Pika or another um, driver without uh, down, downtime. And polishing, fixing, and as usual. Um, that's it. What I can say about Pika driver, and uh, I have I have to speak about the uh, MQ driver too. So also um, during this Metaka uh, development cycle, we uh, rewrite uh, rewrote. Uh, Rabbit MQ, uh, zero MQ driver. Uh, again, why we do this? Why do we do this? Uh, because um, uh, we understand that uh, broker-based solution is uh, have uh, a lot of uh, uh, benefits, but we also realize that uh, probably the biggest and uh, uh, disadvantages of uh, broker-based uh, messaging is a centralized broker and uh, its uh, limited uh, ability to scale. Um, and we need at least uh, ability to, uh, uh, to make deployment without central broker, at least to test. Mm. Uh, we had previously all the RMQ driver, but it was uh, not maintained. And um, after code review, we decided that it would be easy to rewrite it at all. And uh, now we have new the RMQ driver. Uh, probably. I have already thought about this. Uh, this slide we can you can find the goals uh, which we um, made for uh, development of new driver. So it should cover of uh, tempest scenarios. For now, it uh, does this, but uh, we have only problem with uh, cellometer scenarios. Mm. That's probably it. We can go forward. Uh, so, uh, to optimal implementation, we need to map um, Oslo messaging patterns to zero MQ patterns. Uh, was decided uh, to, to implement call uh, using dealer router. Uh, zero MQ message boxes, cast over push pull, 
message boxes and fan out over uh, pops up. Uh, and also we have uh, two option of deployment. First of all, peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. That means that each client will be connected to each uh, server. It's uh, very expensive uh, for connection number and um, don't really work for uh, big deployments. Therefore, but it's very fast. Uh, therefore, to fix this issue, we also have a proxy solution where we have a proxy on each uh, controllers to uh, combine all connections from this host to this proxy and then have only a few connections to other hosts. Uh, also, this driver, uh, for now, it has only uh, matchmaking, matchmaker uh, based on radius, but uh, it implements, uh, uh, it has pluggable in interface and you can implement your own matchmaking mechanism. Um, uh, this is um, uh, option of deployment uh, when we have uh, here we have uh, common deployment just at radius for each controller for matchmaker as matchmaker and uh, uh, publisher proxy for uh, cast for now. Uh, I will explain it a bit on the next slides. Here also we can find uh, some information about uh, count of connections used and it's actually very big. Uh, here uh, explained uh, differences between, between broker-based deployment uh, peer-to-peer -peer deployment when each host connected to each other and the uh, um, deployment which uh, proxies I said about before. Here just some cal calculation uh, uh, how to estimate uh, no number of connections created. On this slide um, you can uh, uh, see um, how, what type of the RMQ sockets we are using for uh, calls and uh, direct casts means not for now casts uh, we use uh, the RMQ dealer mailbox uh, for client and the RMQ router for service it's recommended solution and we haven't invented the wheel. Um, and on this slide, uh, you can see um, fan out uh, pattern. Um, we have always here a publisher proxy uh, because um, we can say that in 0MQ, publisher uh, implements uh, something like broker so it, it uh, handles ma uh, handles messages delivery so we uh, should always have some endpoint to pu publish the message therefore we have pops up pattern here between uh, service and publisher proxy and the uh, MQ dealer router connection to connect clients to publisher proxy uh, it's uh, the same uh, graph, but uh, for uh, b options of deployment with uh, proxy for calls and direct casts. Almost the same, but we have one uh, extra router proxy layer. 
uh, and how to try uh, the RAMQ driver, we can uh, find uh, uh, on these links. You have a few options, uh, just uh, enable it in OpenStack, uh, use DevStack plugin, for example, if you want to run DevStack jobs, uh, run uh, simulator uh, just to, to test it, and probably that's it. Uh, known issues, too many socket consumption, as I said before. Uh, some issues with services recovery and uh, after restarts. Um, I don't know details, but I think it's connected with um, uh, with Redis Matchmaker uh, because it's cache and so somehow it can um, contain uh, not valid data. Silometer doesn't doesn't we, doesn't uh, yet work properly. Uh, I also don't know details, but uh, I, my best guess that is because Silometer. Um, requires sending notification when uh, anybody listens it, and this notification should be stored and processed later. <coughs> uh, and uh, uh, general, probably, uh, disadvantages of uh, 0MQ is um, that messaging is not reliable, so we have in our plans to have, to try implement heart beating and um, uh, retrying uh, and acknowledgement, but um, for now, at least for me, it's not clear is it needed or not because it's the RMQ and probably if we need uh, uh, guarantee of delivery, probably we should use something else. Uh, plans for futures. What's interesting here? Uh, try to new transport for multicast means uh, you, you usage uh, different uh, uh, pro uh, network protocol to send multicast. It should be much more efficient. Uh, Provide alternative node discovery, but uh, I don't know who needs this, but probably why not. <laughs> mm. And may use uh, Curve Zero MQ to provide security. Probably uh, somebody requires uh, secured messaging. Uh, thank you for attention. Angus will say it a bit about uh, Oslo. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. thanks uh, right, let me just switch over here. Using right the powers of computers. There we go. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm Mangus, and um, Kevin also helped me out with this talk here. So just quickly, I'm going to talk about um, this new Oslo Proofset library and the problem that it's trying to cover, um, what RootRap also uh, used to do, um, why, why do we do this at all, uh, a little bit of a history of RootRap and how we got here, and then uh, just talk about Proofset and what it's currently up to. So OpenStack components, like a lot of client server um, servers. Um, basically, you have clients coming in off, off the internet, off the network. The server mediates access to some sort of important resource. So it might be starting virtual machines in Nova, it might be manipulating kernel routing tables in the case of Neutron, it might be accessing object files uh, from the big shared directory for uh, a Swift object server, um, anything like that. So it acts as a layer between the untrusted users and whatever it is that's important. Uh, so when security people look at something like this, they see something more like this. So there's, you have to assume there's bugs in that code. And so 
The problem that Rudrap and Princep are really dealing with is how do we design that defensively? How do we plan for the fact there's going to be bugs there and then try to minimise the impact of, of some sort of exploit there? Because fundamentally what you're providing is access to the outside world where the outside world can come in to you and then you've got to stand between that and whatever your important resource is. So, uh, yeah, the approach taken by lots of similar components uh, around software generally is the principle of least privilege. You want to break up your software into different components and give them only the privileges they need to do their job. Um, in an open stack case, typically the privileges you need are root privileges. You need to manipulate a kernel routing table. You need to manipulate uh, the, the hypervisor. So what we're trying to do here is make it so that most of our open stack code does not run as root, although some of it can when it needs root in order to do whatever the important thing is. So we have most of our code runs as a normal unprivileged user, and that's all of your you know, JSON decoding, all of just the manipulating the HTTP requests and responses, um, and then eventually you have a small focus bit of code that does your high uh, privileged uh, operations. And the hope there is you've got a smaller bit of code so you can audit it more carefully, um, and it's a smaller bit of code, so there's just less likely to be bugs there. All right, so event, um, originally, the way OpenStack uh, did this sort of thing was by sudo. You, you run most of your open, OpenStack code as a normal user, and when you need to do a particular privileged operation, you would run sudo, just like a normal admin would in a situation. Um, and so, as you can imagine, gradually over time, the sudoers file that was required grew quite large. Uh, and that, maintaining that was a problem. So the next attempt was Nova root wrap, or sorry, root wrap generally. Um, and we have one entry in sudoers that runs root wrap, and then root wrap has a slightly more expressive uh, filters files, which allow you to say exactly what should be allowed and what shouldn't be allowed. And here's an example of um, the sudoers entry needed for Nova root wrap, and then a couple of examples of the sorts of things you have in root wrap filters files. So there's run mount as root, uh, and that one runs cat on files, paths that match that regex. Um, and the idea with RootRap is you can add more filters that uh, capture the particular checks you want to perform. Um, a problem with RootRap is that it's a Python process. So every command you want to run um, is now sudo a Python process and then the thing I actually wanted to do. And Python has a fairly slow startup time. So particularly for cases like Neutron, where the Neutron router will be doing many, many uh, trivial operations to set up addresses and routing tables. They're trivial IP root commands. Um, and it's doing many of them. This overhead of starting root wrap again every time became significant. So particularly for the Neutron case, but it's also useful elsewhere, was root wrap daemon, where you start the root wrap daemon once on first use, and then it hangs around, and you talk to it, and it runs commands repeatedly through it, but you're not paying the Python startup cost again and again. Uh, the nice thing about this is it's a very easy transition from the previous root wrap case. Um, now, the problems we have at this point are the root wrap filters are not expressive enough. They're acting at a very low level, and you've lost a lot of the context okay, I wanted to copy a file, why was I copying the file? Where was I copying it from and to? How do I know whether I should allow this particular copy operation? So these three down the bottom here are actually from the Nova, default Nova uh, root wrap filters. And as you can see, there's no information there about what should be allowed or not. They're simply allowing CP as root with any arguments, um, DD as root with any arguments, Chmod with root as any arguments. Um, and so unfortunately, even though we've got all this framework in place, I'm sure you can work out uh, how to exploit um, those three commands. Um, so uh, if, if you did manage to break into a Nova compute server, you know, a buffer overrun in the JSON decoding library or something unpleasant like that, um, you would then be running as the Nova, AP, uh, the Nova compute user, and you would be able to use these root wrap filters to fairly easily escalate to root from that point. So it's not actually giving a lot of defense. Um, the command lines are clumsy. They're, they're long and hard to generate. Uh, and if you look at the Neutron IPlib file, it's 800 lines or more of code that is just there to generate and parse the output of IP root commands. Um, 
and executing commands is slow. So uh, again, the Neutron example does many IP commands. Um, what they're doing is fundamentally, in most cases, a single netlink call. So it should be a very cheap kernel operation to just add that address or, or see what the addresses currently are. Um, we shouldn't have to pay the startup cost of running sudo and IP um, again. And just to give an example, this is some statistics Kevin collected. Um, uh, simple operations done by Neutron. So uh, attaching a router, um, an existing router to a new subnet is 57 separate calls to the IP command. Um, now presumably some of those can be cleaned up, but that's what's currently happening. Uh, and then a problem that really came to the front with the Liberty and Mataka cycles uh, was how do you keep the root wrap filters in sync? Root wrap filters are basically a duplicated copy of the commands. Somewhere in the Python code is the logic to generate that command line. And then in the root wrap filters, you basically have to have the same command line appearing to allow that command to be run by root wrap. And so keeping the code and the root wrap filters in sync becomes a real problem, um, particularly when the code is in a library like OS Brick or OS Vif, and yet the filters are in the end uh, project like Nova. Um, so managing those two uh, is problematic. We don't have good processes for that. We don't have good tools for that. Um, so to address these problems, uh, we introduced Pritzep, I was the Pritzep library. Um, the fundamental idea was to move from command lines to func Python function calls. Let's move to something a bit more expressive, a bit more uh, matching what we actually want to do. Um, it must be easy to use securely. The root wrap filters, you could add a new root wrap filter class, but no one ever did, which meant lots of people use the same uh, regex match or, or usually just the same command match um, and didn't go to the extra work required to say, and I only want arguments that match these patterns or match this policy. So a lot of them are just CP as any arguments as root uh, and variations of that. Um, and also, because we're going through sudo all the time, we can't use a lot of the new features. So Unix traditionally has had this all or nothing security model. If you're root, you can do everything. If you're not root, you can't do anything. Um, and so new, thing, new features have been added. Uh, Linux capabilities, uh, SE Linux, um, set comp uh, have been added to Linux to try to break up that root user into something more fine grained. We can't use any of those with root wrap because sudo doesn't allow us to use those. And uh, any time you try to set up something like that, you're using sudo, which is punching through and just going straight back to root, uh, full root powers. So we want something that lets us take advantage of these new features. So here's an idea of what Prusep looks like from the developer's point of view. Um, it's designed to be very simple. If you want to add new functionality to it, it is as easy as defining a, a function and putting a decorator on it. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have the privileged what will run in the privileged portion, and the, uh, on the right-hand side is the regular unprivileged code. And you can see it just looks like a function call on the right-hand side, and it just looks like a function declaration on the left-hand side. Very, very simple. Um, and then once per project, all the magic is in that decorator. So once per project, you do something like this, which just declares that decorator. Um, you don't need to worry about the details there. Basically, that's just using the, the actual Oslo proof step library to create a singleton object, which you then use for your decorators. Um, down the bottom here, you'll notice there's, it's setting the default capabilities. So this is the Linux capabilities. All functions called through this particular one will be run with capsys admin, capnet admin, and no other privileges, no other capabilities. So even if it's running as user ID zero, it still can't, for example, uh, arbitrarily change permissions on files. It can't load new kernel modules. Um, there's a whole lot of octals and, and things that cannot be done through this, even though you're running as user ID zero. Um, and for most cases within OpenStack, this is a good fit because they're uh, fairly single use. You know, Neutron really just does network manipulation. Um, Cinder really just does iSCSI sort of, you know, file system volume operations, mounting, unmounting. Um, Nova is a bit more complicated because it um, has a bit of everything. Uh, but even for the Nova case, we can have more than one of these contexts which have different privileges for each one. All right. So, Proofsef works by having a, a, it spins off a helper process. And the helper process runs sort of like root wrap daemon does as a persistent process with privileges. 
and there's a simple Unix socket between the unprivileged, the, the regular process, and this helper process, and then it's passing the function I want to run and the arguments. The helper side verifies that that's okay. Yes, it's declared properly. Yes, it had the right decorator. Yes, it was meant to run. Uh, it runs the function, returns the result, or, or an exception object if, if one of those happened back across the socket. It's very, very simple, and sockets are used every, every time. Um, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, avoiding the root wrap overhead, uh, sorry, avoiding the exec overhead again and again, this is, was about 20 times faster on my original benchmarks compared to root wrap daemon. Uh, since I've lost a little bit of speed since then in some um, uh, multi-threading locking and stuff, but I know where those problems are, so I need to go and re regain some of that speed. Um, but that's the sorts of advantages that are available here. Uh, so from the operator's point of view, um, when you look at the process table, you'll see the extra helper process running. And the helper process has to start, has to get those root powers originally somehow. And that can either happen through sudo or through root wrap. You just need some way to start it um, initially. Uh, and then in the Oslo config of Nova, Neutron, whatever, you have a new section which tells you what the helper program, the, the helper command you're going to run is. The user ID and group ID, that should change to after it started, and those default to root. Um, so there's sort of no change there. And then the capabilities, and that overrides those default capabilities that were set by the project. So you will probably never need to change those unless you have a particular, unless you know your particular deployment options don't need those defaults. They, need, they can do with less than that. Um, I, at the most paranoid setup, you would run this as a user ID that was different to the user ID you were running your regular project as, and that also wasn't root. Um, but that's, that's if you're being extremely paranoid. Um, so current status, it was merged into OS Brick um, a week ago, two weeks ago. So it's in early in the Newton cycle. Uh, the development was done last cycle, but they wanted to hold off so that it's getting the most testing it can over this cycle before the next release. Uh, the OS VIF uh, similarly just went in. Um, and the Neutron change is in active development right now. I've, I've written most of it. Um, and that converts all the RPLib calls over to uh, Netlink calls directly. Um, this current status, uh, and this we're up to. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to chase me down during the conference uh, at some point. Thank you. <laughs> now, over to Doug for the last small amount of time. Thanks. Trader. I'll just talk. Okay. Um, so we, in addition to some of the features that we've been talking about in the earlier part of the presentation, um, one of the benefits for projects adopting Oslo libraries is that we also provide features that are not necessarily used at runtime, but are used to do things like prepare documentation or prepare sample files and things like that. So uh, we've done a couple of different things um, in the past two cycles related to that. Um, in Liberty, I think it was, we completely rewrote the configuration generator. So uh, projects that use Oslo config have the ability to generate sample configuration files with all of the configuration options organized into their sections with help text and uh, default values and things like that. We rewrote the way that project works so that um, we uh, basically to make it more robust and to make it so that the generated output is uh, a little bit easier to manage. Um, so now you actually have the ability to, for example, generate a different sample configuration file for each uh, daemon that you produce within your project. So uh, Nova has three or four or five, I don't know how many different daemons they're running these days. Um, each one could have a separate configuration sample file for only the options that actually apply to that thing. Um, as part of that, um, oh, you got it. Yep. 
Okay, cool. I'll, I'll run it. You okay. Um, so as part of that, uh, the, the output itself is the same format, but the inputs are a little bit different, and you can do a little bit more with it. Um, so next, uh, next. Um, we also extended that so that in addition to generating a sample configuration file, we can generate reference documentation for the options in a little bit more easy to read format. So you get a nice table, and you flip over to the next, uh, one more. Um, yeah, nope, sorry, this, this is the integration to actually embed the, the config file in the documentation. Keep going, we don't have time to cover all of this. Okay, so you get a table, you get all your configuration options, they're organized by the groups where they would need to appear in the configuration file. Um, you get uh, bold text and things like that, which you can't really do in a plain text file. Um, this is sort of proof of concept work right now at this point. So we've integrated this into a few of the different uh, projects developers documentation and we're going to be working with the do uh, documentation team this cycle to see how we can use it for their configuration manual so that we can pull all of the configuration options in automatically as they get changed in different projects. All right. Um, one of the other things that we're doing, uh, most of the projects that have adopted uh, Stevedore for loading plugins for things like drivers will be able to take advantage of automatically generating reference documentation for those drivers as well. So you can put a, a little bit of documentation about the driver right there in the code and then integrate it with Sphinx, which we use for building all of our uh, developer documentation and, and the documentation team has actually adopted it now too for the manuals. Um, you can extract all of that information from the code and it formats it nicely so you get a nice list of what the drivers are, maybe some tips about which configuration options you need to go look at in order to enable them or use them uh, correctly or, or optimally and that sort of thing. All right, so things that we're going to be working on this cycle, I mentioned uh, that the config generator and uh, integration with Sphinx was proof of concept, so we're gonna work on refining that a little bit. Um, right now it takes the same inputs that the uh, sample file generator does, but that means that you might have less control over which options actually show up on a page and when you're building reference material you, you typically want to have uh, a little bit of uh, exposition and then some options and some more exposition and that sort of thing. Um, and then could you go back one? Yeah. Um, and then uh, I mentioned that we were going to be working with the documentation team as well. So I think that's pretty much it and I think that probably we're out of time. So there's reference information about using all of these things in the documentation for the libraries where they uh, live. Um, oh, and we're probably also going to be looking at generating sample policy files as well uh, with the work that's going on in the policy library. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank uh, you. We are out of time, so you can just ask questions if you want. Thank you.